Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the third of the TRI Research Translation Committee's major seminars for 2021. And um, today, we our program is Queensland Health and the Queensland Genomics Program, developing a business case and strategic development. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, and pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as First Australians. We value and celebrate the uniqueness of their knowledge, cultures, histories, and languages that have been created and shared for at least 65,000 years. And we pay our respects to their elders and um, extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present today. So um, I just um, wanted to mention that um, uh, Queensland Health Genomics was a $25 million transformation program commissioned by Queensland Health to accelerate the adoption of genomics and lay the foundation for the future of genomics in Queensland. Over five years, this implementation has focused translational research program invested in clinical activity, built capability and community to activate them in the program. And um, so I'm gonna hand it over to our two speakers today um, so that we have um, David Bunker, who's the executive director of the Brisbane Diamond Tina Health Partners and Prof Keith McNeil, who's assistant deputy director general and chief medical officer in the prevention division and uh, chief clinical information officer with Queensland Health. Wow, what a title. Okay, well, um, thank you for that introduction, Ranjeni, and welcome to everybody in the room today and those who are online. I can't see the screen of how many people's on, people are online, but um, thank you very much for your attendance. Yes, yeah, so today's a, a talk on genomics and Queensland Genomics, the program, but also where genomics is going, the role that genomics has in precision health, and really what the future of our health system is going to look like. So today, Keith and I are going to, um, I guess, tag team on this presentation. I'll just do a little brief introduction and Keith's going to talk about um, what was Queensland Health trying to achieve through this $25 million investment that was Queensland Genomics and, and why invest in genomics. I'm going to talk about the program itself and what the program did. So it's an overview of the, I guess, the, the design of the program, but also a focus on the impacts and the outcome um, and how that program comes to a conclusion and what will come next. And then Keith will, will talk about where the department's going in terms of its precision health roadmap, and also where the genomics policy is laying down foundations for the future of our health system in this state. Um, so um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we're meeting today and pay my respects to um, Indigenous people uh, as First Nations people and also uh, anyone on the call today. Uh, so I have to do a little bit about BDHP as well. Um, so just to let you know that the focus of this organisation is on translational research. We're one of a set of research translation centres that work together across Australia. Uh, and our partnership is uh, the Department of Health, um, the five major hospital and health services around the southeast corner, but also with statewide remit, so Metro North, Metro South, but also the Children's Health Service, West Morton, Ipswich and West Morton, and also the MARTA. And then we also have five university and research institute partners in the University of Queensland, Queensland University of Technology, the TRI, um, the QIMR Berghofer, and also CSI Rose eHealth Research Group. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about very quickly, what do we mean by translational research? Now, when I started the Queensland Genomics Program in 2016, the idea that we were doing translational research wasn't really in my head. Um, I think at that stage, people were building up this idea of what translational research was. So I wanted to just pause and say, what do I think translational research is about? And fundamentally, it's about the health system's agenda for research and innovation and how to adopt and adapt the best research capabilities that we have here in Queensland, but potentially from all over the world. So I think it's really important health system leadership is part of this. 
So I'm uh, not a clinician or a researcher by background. My background's in technology and, and business and management consultancy. Um, so for me, I think about how the business of health delivery and the business of research can come together where we're trying to mobilize research into practice and also research into the way the system works and business transformation. What I worry about is this little graph I've drawn here, which I've seen other people do, which is this difference between what we know in terms of our scientific understanding, but the way we practice. And we know that gap will get worse as we go along if we're not trying to bring these streams together. Um, so in terms of Brisbane Diamond Tina Health Partners, I've talked about our members and we have a strategy with these four pillars around making the business easier, about strengthening and positioning Queensland uh, translational research, fostering targeted areas and also reinforcing our high performing partnership. We also have a set of priorities that we're working on at the moment. And I've only got this slide really up to say that genomics and the other omics that lead to precision health and personalized medicine is very much part of the agenda uh, for the partnership and for what we do in Queensland. So I'm gonna hand over to Keith now to talk about what it was that Queensland Health were looking to achieve through the Queensland Genomics Investment Uh, thanks, David. Um, so think back to 2016, which is not that long ago. Uh, I was in the UK actually working with uh, Genomics England building the 100,000 Genome Project. Uh, at that time, uh, we hadn't got 100,000 genomes together, got about 10,000, mainly in cancer and a few in rare diseases. And we hadn't built the informatics pipeline either. So, you know, it's relatively recent in terms of, of where genomics at a, at a whole system scale has been going 2016. And prior to that, genomics was really about researchers discovering genes uh, and coming up with nice scientific papers. But from a health system point of view, it was a so what analogy. How is genomics going to actually help us run a more effective healthcare system, i.e. deliver better outcomes for patients and do that and help the sustainability of healthcare delivery? So when the Queensland Genomics Program was, uh, was conceived, it was really asking that question about how do we translate what is discovered in genomics into better outcomes for patients? And how does that help us run this health system more effectively, more productively? And how do we do that critically in partnership? Because we weren't working in partnership in translation and we needed to bring partners together. And so the funding stimulus, and you, it always acts as a lever uh, for, for people's behaviour, was firmly in mind, uh, getting people to act in partnership together between academia, between the health system, between clinicians on the ground, health administrators, commissioners and industry, to bring that group together to see how we could change the dial in terms of how we were providing healthcare in a sustainable way forward and critically providing better outcomes for populations of patients. Now, I will talk about later on uh, what we're doing um, coming through now after the end of Queensland Genomics. Uh, and suffice it to say that this program, as David will outline, has really laid the foundation for us uh, within, with targeted investments to, to set up a platform that's going to enable us really to take this forward in a really consolidated partnership mind and provide benefits for everybody again, across those layers for patients and consumers, for clinicians, for translational researchers, for academia and for industry as we go forward. And with that, I'll hand back to David. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. So I guess um, a little bit of history. So um, prior to the Queensland Genomics Program, I was working at the National Digital Health Program. I was one of the senior executives in the organisation leading um, the nation around digital health. Um, and so the opportunity to come and work in Queensland around the genomics area was really exciting. I was a head of strategy for the health program amongst other activities. And I knew that things like um, blockchain and AI and genomics were gonna be key to the future of the health system and the digital agenda. So the opportunity to work in genomics was really terrific, but uh, full admission, I don't know a lot about genomics. Well, I didn't know a lot about genomics back then and the learning curve was pretty steep, but at the same time, the principle of bringing people together to be able to understand what we're trying to achieve and co-design that program was really 
I guess, the, the thing that I was looking for and to get good advice and listen to the people who are on the ground and doing the doing. Um, so my goal was not to lean into the politics that had been behind you know, the program leading up to its commencement. So what I'm gonna to do today is take you through the program to understand how we structured it. How did we spend the $25 million? There were a whole set of rules or in the business case about the way the funding would be allocated across three rounds, um, the nature of the first round, which was a grant based round, uh, the idea of clinical demonstration projects and looking at our capabilities we'd need to do. But this is a story about how you pivot and you try and build agility into a program that means with good governance and oversight that you can track towards what the problem is. So when we started the program, a lot of people would say, well, what is the answer? What will you achieve in five years time? And not because of my personal knowledge of genomics, the trick was that as a community, we didn't really know what that was. And we had to understand what were the strengths and capability that the Queensland Health System was and how we actually had to lay down those foundations for a health system that was gonna be applying genomics and really accelerate our capability. But the notion of course was that we would leverage the strengths of our research community to actually bring the intelligence about the application of genomics and the infrastructural capabilities to bear. So this is a story about moving from granting to co-design and to commissioning. So um, we're very honored to have been able to publish the nature of the program, um, an adaptive approach for integrating genomics into the public health system. Uh, so working with um, the, the authors there, largely the Queensland genomics team and a couple of the key leaders in the system, people like Robin Ward and Keith, uh, who were very much instrumental in the oversight of the program during its course of, of time. Uh, and also a special thanks to QIMR Berghofer, uh, to Miranda and Nick Waddell for their support in bringing the paper together. Now, I'm not gonna to talk to the paper as such, but what I'm saying is that we thought a lot about the purpose and structure, how we would design the program, how we would ensure the program had demonstrable impacts not a kind of a go back revisionist history, ROI benefits, sort of return on investment benefits case, um, but actually say, we can see that the program has made a difference to the way we are driving forward with genomics and that the program itself would lay down that foundation. The notion of the program was to accelerate genomics into everyday care. And so that was really, you know, a little bit of naivety on my part and a little bit of guile to go, well, if we're gonna do what it says on the box, then we actually have to way, think about the way the health system delivers care every day and to everyday people. Uh, and that was really the, the sort of the mantra that was in my head. Um, the other thing was to say that it was a five-year program that would shut down. Um, I traded heavily in the beginning of this program in engaging a lot of the people who were you know, caught up in the politics of, of a big chunk of money um, to really say, you know, we're not gonna be a competitor. We're not gonna be here long-term. I'm not gonna build another silo. We're here for five years to spend this money so that all of you guys can work together and all of you get to have an uplift here. So $25 million program from 2016 to 2021, uh, despite COVID, we didn't have any extensions. So we finished in June of this year um, as per the business case. Um, my expertise is in complex systems and complex programs and delivering on time and on budget. And we did that. Now, notwithstanding that there's still a lot of work going on at the moment, and Keith will talk a bit about um, the group inside the department that are leading all the policy and work. But this was really the rules of the game at the start. This idea that we would invest, the business case said, in three program streams around clinical activity, around capability, and around engaging community. And that we do that through these three funding rounds. So the core objectives for the program was to build an evidence base for clinical genomics. How is the everyday system, health system, going to quantify the value of, of genomics? Um, the health system is a, what I call a rationing system, which is to say there's only so much money in the pot. And that means if you're going to fund something new, you are effectively working out what you're not gonna fund. There's no new money that necessarily comes into the system. And if it does, it's always complicated and has strings. So we had to build an evidence base around these clinical activities to understand how funding would be contemplated for genomics activity going forward. Um, we had to think about the management of all of the data. Now, my background is in, in, is in technology and data and digital. So this is where I felt very much at home about understanding the nature of genomics, the data, how it was used, bio, computational platforms, all the high performance computing, that's, that's really my thing. So this idea of how we would build a management around that, that contemplates the secondary uses, but the value of that data beyond its collection for a particular clinical episode 
or a particular research activity? How are we going to capture that data in such a way that we would continue to get benefit from that data? This idea of timely and cost-effective diagnostics, there's no better reality check than when you're working with a clinician, and all of the clinician researchers here will know this, that says, well, that's fascinating, but by the time I get the result of that test, my patient will be dead. Okay, so you've got to work how the, the timeliness of the diagnostic process is going to actually sit within the way that healthcare is delivered within these particular clinical activities. The notion that the sequencing itself would be used for the benefit of patients. So we worked really hard on this program to bring community and patients to the centre. And I'll talk a little bit about how we did that later on. Workforce was a key issue for us as well. Um, and I've got a slide that will go into a bit more detail. But once again, if we're talking about how genomics, precision health, these massive amounts of new knowledge that is coming to the system is going to work every day, you have to start by understanding the in situ workforce and how do we deal with that? We literally can't grow enough genetic counselors quick enough or you know, um, genetic pathologists, et cetera. So you've got to think about the role that mainstreaming has for that broader workforce. <clears throat> um, this notion of accelerated translation of genomics research into healthcare, this is very much the formula for um, BDHP as well. How do we support that flow of research into the system? And like all things in life, there's a backwards and forwards relationship. So not only do you want to know how research can go into the health system, but you also need to know what the health system needs so the research can come and start answering those questions. Public awareness and understanding. Um, I had a lot of internal battles with my team about a Facebook page. I, we didn't end up having one. I didn't think we were ready. But we found organisations with front-facing or public and community-facing roles groups like Epilepsy Queensland, groups like Health Consumers Queensland that gave us access to a big consumer group to really push this agenda around public awareness and understanding and test what that meant. Because like all of these areas, there's a lot of assumptions about what people's expectations are around privacy and access to all of this. And just as an interesting aside, it's been fascinating to watch the COVID story emerge here where you'll hear chief health officers talk about, you know, sequencing for the virus. And the distinction doesn't seem to have really been made, obviously, about sequencing the person versus the virus. But for whatever reason, a lot of the concerns we had about that and that we were worrying about in terms of genomics sort of seemed to disappear very quickly. And the idea that there's someone out there doing genetic or genomic profiling of the virus and, and people seems to just be the way the system works. So it's important to understand those assumptions and to validate them with good evidence. And ultimately, we were supposed to make a positive contribution nationally and internationally. Now, I've done a lot of work at an international level in, in my various roles. Actually, having Queensland come from sort of almost nothing, or certainly not understanding what it was currently doing to leapfrog to an international level, I thought was very aspirational. But our program did genuinely make a mark at a national level. Uh, and one of the things that we developed amongst other bits of work, which are really world leading in some respects, and certainly nationally, was our understanding around the information management. Queensland Genomics delivered on behalf of the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council a national approach to genomic information management and a blueprint for how genomics would work, which brought together research and health systems delivery. Uh, and now industry are also part of that story. So we really did genuinely make a contribution. And I think that publishing that paper in the Nature article is also representative of the reach that the programs had. So that were the rules. Timing is everything, and there were a set of rules. We would commence in July, and we basically had to get ministerial approval. I look back at the time it took us to actually write the contract. So Queensland Health were the commissioning agent, and the University of Queensland had been selected as the administering agent or the auspice for the program. So I worked for UQ on paper, but I had a deal with Robin Ward, who was the DVCR at the time, that I would never feature in the executive structure of the University of Queensland, and that my business card would never say at UQ because we weren't there to serve UQ. UQ was my back office. We were there to serve the Alliance and all of the members of that group. Um, but when I reflect back on what we had to do from effectively when I started in July to when we opened the call in around about October, we got a contract in place for $25 million. We had the minister announce an award. We had the process approved by the government to run the first round. And we did all that in about three months. Now, now my lived experience of contracting and the, the you know, governance within the system, I realised what a remarkable feat that was. At the time, I was super impatient and didn't think we were doing it fast enough. Um, the second rule was to identify four demonstration projects and five capability projects and then get on with it. We were also to establish a community advisory group, which we did in 2017. 
Now, the interesting thing for me as a sort of a, a CEO, if you like, or an executive director, as they refer to me here, is this idea of who, the, who was the board and how was the governance of the program going to work? While I was in the process to get the job, who the board was, was changed three or four times. And when I turned up, there was uh, no kind of uh, formal governance at that stage. So we were to get going um, with this commissioning process and this um, role for UQ. And we were then to work a review of governance and operations to inform how we would go forward. For me, as a CEO, that was a really cool idea. I could get the program going and work at how the governance was going to work as we flew forward. So this notion of being able to be agile and nimble and working the system was really very important. So this is a bit of a timeline, three rounds of funding, which I'm going to talk about in a minute about discovery. How do we know what to do and how to invest, then invest strategically, and then make sure we didn't just sort of finish with a bang, that we finished with what I call a legacy program, which is about handing over and handing back to the system. Um, Okay, there's just a reboot warning on here. I'm just going to ignore. Sorry. Um, okay, so the aim and ultimate achievement was this development of capacity and infrastructure and policies to enable the safe, appropriate and consistent application of genomics in Queensland's public health system. Uh, it would have been cool to do more stuff in industry. It would have been awesome to do more stuff in private. But this was the focus of the program to understand the public health system. And this will become apparent when you see the sort of uh, investments and the impact that we have. Now, for those people who are kind of more on the management science sort of bend like me, this idea of adaptive management approach was really important. But I actually think this is a really important idea in all of the research projects and implementation projects we do in the health and research systems. It's really important that when you're planning a multi-year program, like most of our projects, that you can think about how you can flex and change through that program. Uh, there's almost no program or project that I've ever been involved with which looked the same on the first day as on the last day of the project and navigating that system and all the trade-offs is a really important thing. So the first round we applied as a discovery round, we got that up and running, we had objectives, characteristics, outcomes, we had an investment pot and the rules were set by the department, so away we went. Um, but I knew that because of the nature of these 18 month funding programs that once we had that first round going in sort of March, 2017, it was gonna run for 18 months we didn't have the luxury of waiting to the end of the first round of funding to stop and have a little think about what we would do next. We actually had to run all these things in parallel. So as soon as the first round got up and running, we had to think about how we would run the second round. So it was important that we were looking for lessons about the activation of the projects in the program, not just waiting for the impacts at the end of the research project about how many people sequenced and the efficacy or whatever it might be. The lessons we were learning was about how to invest the government's money to achieve the outcomes that it was looking for and to bring the alliance and the stakeholders together during that process. What we understood with the first round, which was, as I said, a grant-based process, was it was unlikely to affect sustained genomics uptake. What we were doing is we were investing in research, but the health system was a very passive party to that program. And so it was important to really engage them because they were ultimately going to hold the legacy of their program in terms of an uplift in Queensland Health. So in the second and third round, we structured in this idea of a strategy round and then a legacy round, as I mentioned before, we needed to understand how to invest and to move to a commissioning model. The first round was terrific because what it let us understood is where was all the capability in the QUTs and Paul Leo's here for argument's sake from the ATGC group here, or the capability in UQ or the capability in QIMR, or indeed the capabilities in Pathology Queensland. So we were trying to understand through that first round of funding how and what capabilities are in place. Did we even know how much sequencing was being done in Queensland and where those tests were being completed? So we did a lot of work to really understand what was going on and, in, you know, and use that first round to, to prove out what we needed to do such that we could invest in a strategic fashion in the second and third round. So this is where the idea of co-design comes up. Now, this is very popular these days. Everyone talks about co-design, co-production, these sorts of ideas. So this is just a very quick overview of, of, of what we did. Now, I'll say right now, a lot of words on the screen. I'm not going to talk to them all. I try and put as much into the slides as possible because they'll be shared and people with an interest can go and look at it later. What I want to say here is that in terms of co-design, one of the key aspects for us was this idea of gates. Okay, So gates during that process, we knew that the barrier to entry for clinicians was very high if they had to write a big grant application. So we tried to create a lightweight, low barrier to entry process. So we said to clinicians, 
and you know, marketed that through the clinical networks in Queensland Health, an expression of interest. Give us something in these areas where we know genomics is applicable in cancer and rare disease, et cetera, and give us a very lightweight expression of interest. We wanna work with you through this process to work out what the best set of projects are. So I think we had something like 27 applications come in for that first gate. And we were able to, once again, understand where the needs, demands and strengths were. We then set up a second gate with an advisory group around clinical utility. Our notion was not to do cutting edge genomics in our healthcare system, but to try and apply genomics where we knew there was good clinical efficacy. And if anything, Queensland was falling behind standard of care in terms of the application of genomics in a range of areas, including cancer and, um, and epilepsy and, and in other projects you'll see. The third gate was about partnership and capability. This is where we wanted to make sure that the investment in the capability program was actually going to be supporting these clinical projects. And then the last one was around the business case. So this is a more like a feasibility idea. We realized through the first round of projects, the amount of time it took to get contracts in place and get projects going. So we tried to take all that front loading issues of six months delays to get a project up and running and bring that back into the design phase. So we literally said at that gate, who are you going to contract with and what would that look like before we made decisions? It had to factor into the decision-making process due to the time we had. And then finally, a business case to the Director General for awarding. So just in terms of the capability loop, similar scenario, discovery, defining and designing. We wanted a complementary set of investments in clinical activity and in capability. Um, Keith and I, in his, on his whiteboard in his office back in probably 2017, something like that, I think when Keith came back to Queensland and was providing support in terms of the contact into the department. And we had this conversation about how would we commission, how would we understand what we needed to do? And we basically invented this framework here, this genomics adoption framework. What it did was it leveraged the, the first round, the concept of the capability areas, and said, you've got to basically build these capabilities into the system. And this is where our focus would be. It gave us a way to commission. And so when we were looking at the clinical activities, we could think about, well, what were the workforce challenges? Who would do the sequencing and where would the bioinformatics come from? What were we going to do with the data in terms of the clinical activity? But what was the longitudinal value of that data? And what legal and policy environment were we living in? And importantly, how would we contemplate evaluation of these programs if we want that clinical activity to continue? And that's as much as getting good health economic data, but also buy-in from the hospital and health system. So the projects had to be signed off by the CEOs of the hospitals across Queensland that were involved, where our intention was to implement. Um, this is a complex slide about the process. What I'm saying is the application that was approved was built in parts over time. Okay, so we didn't start with the application, big bang. We built the application such that we went from 27 potentials down to eight certainties. Okay, now, once again, lots of data, I'm not gonna to touch on it. Just wanna show you briefly some of the things we did. I'm really proud of the uh, community advisory group and what they did. That's a photo of all of us there. Um, that community advisory group were really important and we had a very aspirational view of what we could do, which is to say, if we had just sort of got a group together and said, look, this is our program, give us some advice. We wanna do something more than tick the box. We'll just get their input to the program. We actually end up having the group get to that level of maturity such that we could invest in them. And we said, if there were legitimately a set of patient led projects, what would they be and how would we go about investing to do that? And as a result, we had a whole range of projects that we ran that we would never have come across had we not engaged patients and community representatives and advocates in the conversation about genomics and what it would mean to the system. So we reached a really huge audience of consumers. We were able to train interpreters um, and, and people and multilingual health workers. So we realized there are a lot of significant issues and barriers around culture and language diversity, but it was really the community advisory group that gave us a steer on how to go about that and had those linkages. So I'm really pleased with that group. And I'm also very grateful to Health Consumers Queensland for their engagement in the program. The sets of clinical projects that we invested in really fell into sort of, fell into sort of three streams. The first was whole of life. And in this case, what we understood once again from input from the community was that a lot of the genetic or genomic um, disease disorders conditions were lifelong and they went a long way beyond the diagnostics. And a lot of those ones, you know, where it might start in childhood and move into adult years. 
So we wanted to see how projects and genomics could inform people's longitudinal care. And the sets of projects that you can see on the screen really represented that. This idea of, of epilepsy, neurodevelopment, um, paediatrics, and working very closely with Metro North and the genetic health um, service as well around their investments in these spaces, very similar. Um, and so these were the ranges of projects that were selected, and that was the funding investment into that part of the program. Infectious disease was an interesting one. And very briefly, the story goes back to 2016. The business came out, case came out, people were engaged in that. And um, a group from UQ phoned me and said, is it just human sequencing or can we do bacteria? And I could not find anything in the business case that said no or in the background of the workshops. And Queensland Health couldn't give me a sort of a yes or no. So we decided to do it. And we had a very successful infectious disease program led by David Patterson, um, groups from UQ and also Patrick Harris at Pathology Queensland. So this was a really big deal and has done some amazing things. Once again, I'm not going to talk into it, but this was one of those programs that started kicking goals at a health system level in terms of hospital acquired infection within, within about six months of startup. And there's a deep legacy for this program, I believe, in, in this state. Uh, the last area is cancer. You cannot do with genomics without cancer. I want to really thank the Queensland Cancer Network. Um, they gave us a lot of support to understand the application of our findings from round one, but also to think about how cancer was going to feature, um, genomics was going to feature in cancer care going forward. Um, we did a lot of work in the Indigenous space. It was an important area as well. And this is one of those examples of, of legitimate sort of world leading uh, engagement. And just to give you an idea of the way you apply those three streams, in the first round of funding, we committed to a project that was going to re-engage community in a conversation about genomics, and that was it. In the second round, we realised that we could build on that to build literacy program. And then in the third round, which is still going at the moment, the project's finishing up, we actually said, how do we create appropriate referral services into Genetic Health Queensland? So this is a great example of translational research programs building towards something really meaningful. Um, nursing and midwifery, I want to do a quick call out here in the workforce area. We invested significantly because, as I said earlier, you can't build enough genetic counsellors. And if we're going to mainstream genomics into everyday care, nurses play a really important role, obviously doctors as well, but nurses probably spend more time talking to the patients. And we realised that. I want to thank Shelley Nolan, who was the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer in Queensland Health and really understood what we were on about here and helped us get a leadership group together to think about how we'd invest in this space. Um, these are all the different workforce areas we went to. We did work in primary care with um, genomics for GPs, variant curation workshops. Um, in the first round, we funded a, a startup of a master's in diagnostic genomics at QUT, which is now you know, a program that keeps going, and obviously work in areas like microbial and, and, and mid-iron technology. So a, a broad set of things that we did in the workforce space. Now, I'll finish up by just saying, one of the most the biggest impacts we really needed to have was in the diagnostics capability in the state system one of the benefits of doing the program here is we have a statewide public pathology group and we had an important opportunity to sway that group around where they're going with genomics and understand how to invest and build capability so it's a significant amount you know of the overall 25 million that went into pathology queensland but that obviously includes the sequencing itself so Multiple successful projects that now require transition to BAU. This is what's going on right now. Pathology Queensland is really well positioned for the future, and there's a whole range of things that they're looking to do. Um, Keith is now in the prevention division responsible for PQ, so he'll speak a little bit about that. Uh, and this idea of nothing beats in store capacity. So having that capability and being able to grow on it is really critical. Um, this is just to say that in terms of working with a group like Pathology Queensland, which is a large entity, you have to have a very strategic and integrated kind of program of work. So we work very closely with Pathology Queensland to develop a genomic strategy such that our investment wasn't going to finish when our program finished, that they had a platform to keep moving forward into this second phases. So this meant that they were building health system capability with NADA accredited tests in each of these areas, and that these could be continued to use in the system should it decide to fund it. Um, so what did that mean in terms of capability? I'm not going to read this other than to say there was very limited capability when the pre-QGHA, a lot of the partnership and investment program in round two was investing in PQ to deliver for those clinical projects. And we see that they're very well set up to look at things like where are the MBS items coming forward? How do we influence the Hospital and Health Pricing Commission around uh, IPA, the pricing authority, around the items that the feds fund the states? 
Uh, so there's a whole range of work, um, which Keith will talk to in a minute about um, going forward. Um, we had to uplift their IT capability. We had to uplift their workforce capability. Um, and we had to think a lot about how, when our funding ran out, they would be able to keep going and get into this sort of self-funding, self-testing scenario. Okay, you've got to close these things down as well. Uh, so I'm not going to go into detail other than say, you don't just get to June and switch everything off. There's a lot of important things you need to do. And the first thing I'll acknowledge is the Queensland Genomics team. That's the team on the left there. They were an amazing part of this journey. We stuck together basically the whole program, the whole time. So we wanted to make sure all of those folks were looked after really well. We had to finish out the contract, the legal oversights, risk management, all of those sorts of programs, because we didn't want to leave a legacy of issues for the department. We wanted to leave a legacy of opportunity. So we structured a timeline. In fact, we'd started much before this, but we thought a lot about a graceful exit. Um, and we thought a lot about handover and the next steps and what we would do there. Um, we did a lot of work to understand the program, including evaluating the program, working with QT. And we thought a lot about the governance of how the program would work and what the members of the Alliance thought the priorities were going forward. And this all happened during COVID, sort of towards the end of last year. So I'm not going to go to all the details other than to say, when you think about the governance of the program, you have to think about it going forward. And we had a very considered response to this to think of what the top 10 priorities would be. So health outcomes for patients, clinical leadership, um, the, nation, the notion of value-based care uh, and these other priorities. So all of this information was what was handed into the department to springboard them going forward. And uh, there was a process I won't bore you with. So, Professor McNeil, over to you and <laughs> moving it forward. Yeah, thanks, David. A real tour to force through what was, a, as you can see, a program with many, many moving parts. Uh, and on the basis of, of that, we've been left with some platforms or foundations. Uh, and, and in fact, Queensland Genomics did exactly what it set out to do. So we have a foundation of really good partnerships, really strong partnerships between government uh, the department between hospitals and health services, between Pathology Queensland, between ac all our academic partners uh, and industry. Uh, and that's building, we're building on that all the time. We have a platform now of uh, a digital ecosystem that is being built on the back of our health data set, but also on the back of what we need specifically for genomics. And in fact, as David said, uh, we articulated the national blueprint for sharing of genomics information or use of genomics information uh, across the country, and that's been accepted uh, by all jurisdictions, uh, all of whom had input into that. Um, uh, we've, we've got a partnership of capability in terms of, of Pathology Queensland and what it can do uh, on behalf of everybody who wants a, a, a molecular or a genomics test. Uh, and we've got a, part, a, pro, a platform of translational uh, capability. And in fact, I was uh, on the way over here on the bus uh, from town, I was reading something in the ABC uh, published today about a girl with a young girl with Rett syndrome who went on a diagnostic odyssey as often is the case with these inborn errors inborn um, problems for kids can general abnormalities and she was two three years uh, of going through a whole lot of di uh, unnecessary diagnostic tests or actually um, tests that, that showed nothing a lot of treatment uh, for, for putative diagnoses until she had a genomics test uh, which showed exactly what she had and we have now embedded that in terms of a translational uh, program into Queensland Health. We are moving now to build the next phase of this, which is really to move towards precision medicine, which is at the cornerstone of not only sustainability of, of healthcare, but, but also uh, the, the sustainability or the implementation of values-based healthcare. So genomics and precision medicine. Uh, and in fact, that's the roadmap that we have articulated now through the working group, uh, which again brings that partnership together. Uh, it's an ongoing piece of work through to the end of the year, articulating where we want to go as a system with genomics, uh, investing where we want to target our investments uh, and how we're going to go to government for the next phase of funding uh, over the next five years, I would guess. So another 25 or 35 million, whatever we can manage to leverage out of them. But what we have shown is a significant return on investment for Treasury uh, and a significant improvement in the, our ability to translate the patient outcomes. David flicked over the issue there about microbial genomics, but through the use of the work that we did through QGHO, we were able to shut down at least three um, 
uh, extended antibiotic resistant outbreaks in hospitals, which would have otherwise closed wards, uh, a neonatal intensive care unit and a PICU had we not uh, been able to track it down through that. Um, so this working group that we have now is focusing on all of the elements that came out of QGH, all, all of those things that are important. We've got, we've got consumers pivotally involved in it, which is really important because when you are looking at genomics uh, at a population level, consumers have to be involved in how we use their information, how we join that up, how we join the genome up with the phenome, if you like, through our digital ecosystem. Uh, and we're working now through COVID, interestingly, on building a statewide biobanking capability. Uh, and of course, if you think about those three pillars, the genomics omics uh, capability, you think about the digital capability that we're building, and you think about the biobanking capability, that is a platform for really high level uh, effective translational research right there. And that we are building to make available to every researcher across the state, along with a whole lot of other things. So that's the future as we move forward, all based on the work that everybody did around the Queensland Genomics Program, which really showcased how to be flexible and adaptable into how to do things. And we pivoted very quickly from doing grant-based grant uh, research to building foundational infrastructure, enabling people to take that and use that to translate that into outcomes. So, you know, bright future ahead of us, uh, despite the, 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 the difficulties of COVID, uh, difficulties with funding, we've been able to build something which is quite special. And I can tell you, it's just every bit as good as what we were building in the UK for the 100,000 Genome Project. And they're very jealous of what we've been able to do here. So I'll hand back to David to finish off. Thanks, Nick. Let me just hang around. I think we've got some time for yeah. Q&A. Um, so I will finish with my slide here, which is, you know, it's that classic Henry Ford. If I asked people what they wanted, we would have had faster horses. And I think that is really the story of this program. The idea that you can bring people together and that you can collaborate and you can co-design something that's going to have a meaningful outcome is, is very much um, what we see. And we see that through BDHP in the program of work for that group as well. So we've got some time for q and I don't know how many people are online. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we don't have a huge audience here. I've got no idea how many people. Oh, we've got 44 online. And I'll check up the queues. And uh, we've got a bit of time for questions. Um, audio feed well, I, yeah, that's an audio feedback question. I can't help you with that one. <laughs> So we've got no questions online. Are there any questions from in the audience today? Hi, Ranjani, thank you. Um, I guess my question is around the 25 million. So, I mean, $25 million, you can, you can either just spend it on grants as, and you decided very quickly that that wasn't what you were gonna do, or you can spend it in a, in a wise way, which is what you appear to have been able to do. Moving forward, how can you harness um, specific pots of money in order to do big programs in an integrated way in which you've done genomics? And I understand that biobanking will Im improve the outcome for many things. And precision medicine is more than just genomics, but includes, you know, biomarkers of other, other types. But how, um, you know, there, there, we can move forward in incrementally with individual grants, or we can get a large pot of money to do a large amount of, of one thing. So how do you see that moving forward? Do you understand my question? Yeah, look, I think so, Ranjani. What, what this program has shown us is that, and, and shown the health system is that investing in these foundational platforms means that everybody can win a prize. So we, we want people to use this capability to leverage their ability to go and get grants to be able to go to MRFF or NHMRC and say, you know, we've got a database here that covers a population now on the IEMR of two and a half million people or more, and 85% of our children, that longitudinal linked health outcome record means that we can do an intervention, we can follow them in real time. That, that, that's a huge magnet for industry. And we've got people knocking on our door now wanting access to that data set. Biobanking complements that obviously, and we'll move into not only physical, but digital biobanking as we get into RNA and all of that sort of stuff, which you know more about than I do. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's what we've been able to leverage at a health department level to build that. 
which of course translates into, into much better outcomes for patients because we can start to see how that, see what their outcomes look at variation, look at value, and also bring in the research to, to embed that. Every piece of research we do then becomes translational because as soon as you do it, you can longer, you can in real time evaluate the outcome of that intervention. So that's the platform that we're building uh, in that respect. I, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but that's the way, that's the direction that we're looking at going. Yeah, Renjini, I think that is a really good question because the challenge with smaller investments is you've got to get something done. It's very hard to leave that legacy in the system. We spent the better part of $25 million in the system and it gets absorbed very quickly because you're dabbling with the bureaucracy that is going to move at a certain pace of its own and you're trying to accelerate that. So, you know, there are things that I would have liked to have done that were more on the innovation scale and the research scale and the pendulum kind of swung back towards the health system and trying to deal with the entropy of that. And that was, you know, a decision we had to get through. But when I talked to the DG, the previous DG about this and said, what do you want the investment to do? And the answer was the beneficiary must be Queenslanders and it must be through the health system. So it was really out of our hands. But I think the notion of getting larger pots of money that bring together capability, that means those smaller investments get more maximum maximized outcome because you're not having to spend money on infrastructural mm -hmm. capability i think that's a really important model and we we tested some of that here but i think trying to build that into the future is a really important concept um just a couple Based of comments nice, yeah it's uh can <laughs> i burn actually i'm say nice things and um, so i think that the genomics program has been a success and uh but we're kind of moving forward into the next level now and for example, the ATGC here, which is the Australian Translation Genomic Centre, is NASA accredited to to do a large uh, yep. uh, 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 panel sequencing, and we have been designated as the lead site here for the most and for the prospect study. So effectively, that's going to be a twenty six thousand patient study across Australia. So I'm just wondering, how do we leverage that and open that up such that Queensland can support that actively by expanding our footprint, if you like, in other words, our capacity to do that degree of sequencing. It's likely that we're going to be sequencing about 2,000 cases a year for this particular study. And we hope to embed that data within the cool uh, 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 data system so that, so that the, the knowledge that we get can be used for other people to do research in genomics. So how would we do that, Keith? How do we go about leveraging support from the Queensland government for a project like that? Good question. Um, yeah, good question. So the government, I don't know if the government will directly support the project in terms of a research project but if it's about the infrastructure that can be shown to be delivering uh, benefits back to patients on the ground or to health systems then then that's part of the whole platform uh, i mean the platform the biobank for instance that we're building it's not a single thing it's a network so we want to network or leverage or network all the capability we've got across the state uh, in terms of what we can bring to bear on the problem uh, and absolutely aware of what you're doing at ATGC. Emphasize that. So we're actually providing a diagnostic service for patients who are really run out of options at the moment or rare cancers. Yeah. And we're, we're going to bring that into earlier stage as time goes by. So I think we are trying to do that. We are trying to not just simply do a research project, but actually this would be real impact for patients who will get access to, to treatments they would not normally get access to. So. It's how do we get that message across that that facility is available? How, how can you help us to do that, Keith? Well, if it's trans, well, one of the things I can say is if, it's, if it is directly related to providing patient care, then that would be through Pathology Queensland, uh, I guess. And that's the access that I can, I can, we can have that conversation at, at that level. Yeah, I think for me, Kim, the vision of the notion that there is capability, including NADA accredited capability, in research labs was should be a very top out of item pq it's not my job to run that group but i think you know lynn griffiths lab at KUT as well there are a number of nada accredited labs uh, and there's a lot of capability and it makes sense to be absorbing that and creating those relationships so that's certainly the, the idea in my head um, i think that you know we continually bring up atgc as a very important asset in queensland and it's certainly on the radar for that uh, genomics executive working group um, so I continue to lobby for it, for sure. Um, and then notwithstanding, you know, what Keith's saying about PQ, that strategy for partnership is going to be critical in not just industry, but for research as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm really hoping to see a transition there. 
I think the key thing to mention is that there are you know, like different CPUs. Yeah. As you mentioned, Sam, the two CPU partnership. So I think you've designated us to do a large set of uh, panel sequencing at the moment. So if there are important things that maybe you guys are kind of aware of that perhaps should be, we're certainly open to working with you guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, just to say that that um, you know the HGC is actually a partnership between Pathology Queensland, between Metro South, and between QUT. So you know we're into we're very much into engaging in that process. Yeah. I normally only get dragged in when things go off the rails, Ken. So yeah. Um, we have got a couple of questions online. So uh, Eric uh, Thompson is making a similar point about ATGC. So hopefully, Eric, that's addressed that question. Um, can you give some granularity to what mechanisms you propose to use slash will be used to continue the programs that have been completed? Good question. So this is very much part of the agenda for that executive genomics working group and those subgroups. There are a series of projects that are effectively getting transition funding. Um, Queensland Genomics didn't spend all the 25 million. There was a little bit left over. Um, so that's part of being able to support them to transition into BAU. Uh, so, as I said, it was very important when we focused on what those projects would be, knowing that they would go beyond June when we would shut down uh, and that they had to sort of keep going and that conversation keeps going. Uh, the Executive Genomics Working Group met earlier this week and there was a conversation about exactly this. So it's very much on the agenda. Well, we're, we're very keen to make sure that we can commission genomics testing as part of the clinical pathway. So it becomes embedded in the normal fun funding and that that comes to the ROI. So the translational programs that's, that, that have shown here where there's benefit, tangible benefits, then we can put that up and say, well, now we need to figure out how, how do we commission this as part of the normal business of running. And that starts to make genomic testing sustainable as opposed to something separate to what we do uh, in every day and having to find extra buckets of money. Uh, and, and Nick Steele and his group, who are responsible for commissioning, are right up for that conversation and how we work that, how we work that into IPA funding, et cetera, et cetera. It, so there was a health, the line up the capability and the clinical projects. One of those capabilities was around health economics. So we did the health economics data around the infectious mm -hmm. disease work, around the cancer work. So there's a whole lot of evidence. One of the things that we realised when we did the review of governance and operation was that you know, like beauty, um, return on investment is in the eye of the beholder. So building a body of evidence that would have to work for the function of the government that looks at strategic procurement of, of clinical services um, was a different, slightly different set of evidence to what a hospital chief executive would need versus what a clinical department lead would need versus what a clinician actually saw in terms of evidence. So we worked to have the evidence be more than just, you know, health economics and counting the pipettes, so to speak, to understand what was the evidence that was going to be needed to carry this into business as usual mm. practice. Uh, and so that included, for example, very early conversations with um, Nick Steele, which he probably doesn't remember, where he was he actually gave us a senior person from his team to work on the little group that was doing the health economics data. We were trying to make sure we were forearming the health economics data and the evidence data to be able to solve all these different issues. So translation is not just the clinical efficacy, it's the nature of the system. You've got to have a, a funding case. You've got to be able to fit it into clinical practice. And so we're trying to build evidence that was going to address as many of those problems as we could. And I think the department is still processing that as well. Um, there's a question about liquid biopsy in cancer, and I'm not going to take that one. Um, so um, I'm sure there's lots of people who can help you there with liquid biopsy's future in cancer. Um, so I'll, I'll, I might leave that one. Um, there is a point here about periodic funding in biobanking. Um, so Keith will want to address this as well, but I guess my observation is that this is the challenge with small pots of money versus a big pot of money. Um, and if you get a big pot of money, you just divide it into small parts, then you effectively perpetuate that problem. So I think the opportunity to try and consolidate, as per Ren Jenny's question, where you can have a focus on the infrastructure so that all the boats in the harbour rise, that's the kind of mantra. And I think that's the challenge with biobanking in this sort of incremental and scattered investment. And we see a lot of that at the end of the research project, they're out of money and out of time, and you've got this asset that gets left behind, which is not okay. So I, I think, Keith, where you're going with the digital biobanking, that idea is supporting and embracing them. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Consolidating, because it, 
provides a benefit to the health system. So there's a benefit for the health system to invest in it. And then everybody gets to leverage the capability. Um, okay. Um, I'm on a promise to KCA to make sure that he finishes at uh, one. So is there any more questions in the audience? Okay, and there's one uh, infrastructure requires funds will not be funded from innovation, tag funding, how will the fund support infrastructure required going forward? Might be a good way for you to finish. I think you kind of answered it, but just to summarize. Well, again, it's about showing uh, value. Uh, and if there's value in investing in the infrastructure, then the health system is going to invest in the infrastructure. That's the bottom line, uh, because we're starting to see that the, the continuum from research right through to clinical outcomes is just that it's a continuum. They're not separate buckets. And we've got to stop working in these extant silos that don't join up. And we're building this to join up that continuum uh, so that there's this pipeline of innovation, uh, uh, research, translating into clinical outcomes into business as usual as we go forward but we need that infrastructure in place to be able to do that and that those lights are starting to go on so elt executive leadership team uh, at the department has signed off this is a roadmap uh, towards what we call precision medicine with all of those elements involved uh, so it's been endorsed at the highest levels of the department okay um there is sorry, one other question over here, um, which is around some of those workforce people coming to an end at the end of the program. Um, I think this is maybe something that we could take back to the executive working group to ensure that those recommendations and funding uh, goes forward. Uh, it does take the department time, sorry, Keith, uh, to make <laughs> the decisions about these things. Any predictors about the, well, where the we're going? The department works at the speed of government, unfortunately, which is, which is not as fast as we would all like. Um, look, if there's, if in terms of the workforce, the idea is if you have a program which is showing benefit and, and showing value, then that, that program will continue as BAU. That's the whole point. And it gets funded out of BAU. Uh, and if you need a, an extra workforce, then that's part of the value equation, Yeah. simply put. Okay. Um, so look, thanks very much, everybody. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the program today. Um, most of the time during Queensland Genomics, it was about the clinical and the community and all these sorts of things. So I, I'm really pleased to be able to talk a bit about how you think about these program structures and strategy. Uh, and I hope this was useful and relevant to you and that you've uh, enjoyed the hour or so with us. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>